Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that very generous pair of introductions. Uh, and thank you to the Academy for inviting me uh, to talk today. And let me bring you fraternal greetings from the American Academy of Arts and Letters uh, as its uh, president at the moment. I'm extremely honored to have been invited to talk to you today. And I want to wade into the turbulent waters surrounding the debates about heritage and restitution. The classical literature of Europe begins with a dispute over war spoils. Sing muse, the rage of Achilles, the Iliad says at its start. But what enraged Achilles? The fact that Agamemnon took from him a young woman he had captured in battle who was originally given to him as part of his prize. The disputes at the start of the Iliad aren't about whether you can take goods and people captured in battle. Nobody doubts that. The question is who among the victors gets what? The English language still has more uh, than one word for these goods, including booty and spoils. Then there's predation, which comes from the Latin word for these spoils, prida. The Greeks had the word harpazo, in German, you have uh, Kriegsbeute. The Torah and the Quran both discuss the division of war spoils. Uh, the Quran says, know that whatever spoils you take, one-fifth is for Allah and the messenger, that's the prophet. Uh, his close relatives, orphans, the poor and needy travelers. And the author of uh, Deuteronomy, uh, who would have approved of Achilles' prize, because in Deuteronomy it says, when you go to war against your enemies, if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her, you may take her as your wife. The Chinese for loot is Shan Li Pin. In my father's language, there's a word for a war captive that makes him into property. We say, wa fan domum. We have taken him as a, a war prize. And the word afadir, literally meaning something that has been taken, anything that's been taken, is the generic term for booty. But my favorite word globally for these uh, terms is the Bengali one, which is loot. Uh, <laughs> um, those of you who can read Bengali will see that. <laughs> so this convention is very, very widespread, one might say almost universal. I begin with the Iliad, but uh, the epic of Son Sundiata or Sonjara, probably the most celebrated work of African oral literature, dating to the 13th century and telling of the establishment of the Mali Empire, is also the story of war spoils. After the fabulous Sundiata defeated his great enemy, a lavish festival took place in which Sundiata's forces displayed their spoils, including newly enslaved war captives and some of the religious idols of their enemy. Over the centuries, the laws of war enshrined the legitimacy of war booty. There were rules, of course. Uh, Cicero's uh, oration against Verres, you'll recall, uh, accused the Sicilian governor of looting for his personal enrichment. But the concern here was with personal corruption, not with the seizing of war spoils. That was fine. Uh, many of the great kings and emperors of Africa as elsewhere, were constantly at war, sustaining their kingdoms with the pelf of conquest. There may be a few people called Christian who also did that. <coughs> so, to the victor go the spoils. This is no longer a sentiment that anyone would want to affirm. After a singularly uh, destructive world war, the 1954 Hague Convention introduced the idea of cultural property into international law because such property was, as it says in the preamble, of great importance to the cultural heritage of every people. The document says, damage to cultural property belonging to any people whatsoever means damage to the cultural heritage of all mankind. The language here is stirringly internationalist. And yet the concept of property, of ownership, seems to leave us thinking that specific peoples 
which usually means states in subsequent UN discussions and conventions, were entitled to specific things. In the new era, the claiming of treasures was to proceed through assertions of cultural patrimony, and the concept of cultural property, as I say, plays a central role here uh, in the new uh, international conventions. Now, there's much, heart about, uh, there's much of this that's obviously a heartening development. What's striking to me, though, is the way in which the internationalist claims have somewhat fallen out of favor, routinely subordinated now to the property claims of modern states, many of which didn't exist when the objects being claimed were made. Growing ranks of critics, meanwhile, call for the decolonization of the museum and interweave two considerations. First, that articles in museums may have been acquired through illegitimate means, morally illegitimate means, and second, that cultural property inherently belongs to those whose heritage it is. For these critics, the two concerns are aligned. Objects from formerly colonized parts of the world, in their view, were seldom obtained fairly and should by default be repatriated, with Africa a particular focus of concern. The Open Society Initiative for Southern Africa has devoted many millions of dollars to assisting civil society organizations and other institutions working, as they put it, to return Africa's heritage to its rightful home. In a recently celebrated work sardonically entitled The Brutish Museums, Dan Hicks, the curator of world archaeology at the University of Oxford's Pitts Rivers Museum, which displays the university's archaeology and anthropology collections, though for how long it's not clear, essentially calls for museums to purge themselves of everything collected during the colonial period. In particular, he calls, of course, for the return of all the Benin bronzes to their rightful owner, uh, the Royal Court of Benin. Like many, he understands the decolonization of the museum as an unwinding, the unwinding of an appalling history of domination. Museum officials, often dragging their feet, but sometimes rushing ahead, have increasingly agreed. Today, the hallways of the great North Atlantic museums echo with calls for repatriation and restitution. Curators in Germany, the United Kingdom, the United States, France, and elsewhere have made preparations to send back objects to what the Open Society Institute called their rightful owners. These are just articles about all this. In France, under President Macron's direction, Felwin Saar and Benedict Savoy produced a 2018 report on, quote, the restitution of African cultural heritage. The appropriation of heritage, the much discussed Saar Savoy report states, is, quote, a crime against peoples. It mentions the famous Benin Bronzes as an egregious victim of colonial depredation. Particular gnosis is also given to the saber of El Hajj Omar Tal, the founder of the Tukulu Empire in Mali, this saber being a war prize that was taken in the 1890s and that reposed for decades in the Musée de l'Armée in Paris. When we gaze upon these objects in museums, the report urges, we should remember the violence they trail. What history do we want to revisit? The authors write. Concerns about provenance have expanded then into a critique of the encyclopedic museum as such. Inasmuch as such museums are bound to display the cultural heritage of other peoples, they are, in Dan Hicks's view, embodiments of colonial violence. For Hicks, scientific collecting of natural history specimens, ethnographic collecting, instances of barter purchase and commissioning, these are all quotes, these are all booty by other means and other names, and they all need to be liberated. Noting that the Benin bronzes were made by the melting of metal, he says that the museum itself should be melted down and radically recast. The Sarsawa report, too, is a critique of the Encyclopedic Museum. Quote, the problem arises when the museum no longer becomes the site for affirmation of national identity, but conserves objects procured from somewhere else and assumes the right to speak about these. Can't resist saying that that notion that museums are about the affirmation of national identity um, makes 
this uh, report very obviously French. <laughs> of course, I find much to applaud in calls to look closely at procedures of acquisition, and I'm certainly not here to take sides in these institutional struggles between the restitutionists and the retentionists in any particular case. But my professional inclination as a philosopher is to sort through the concepts through which these arguments are waged. Between culture and property lies a dangerous intersection, and the formal concept of cultural property has become entangled in competing stories about identity, origins, and ownership. Cultural property is in effect now a movement as well as a concept. And yet the idea, I think, turns out on close inspection to contain buried contradictions that it may be worth digging up. First, though, just a few general words about culture, about heritage and identity. Everything in any museum, including the museum as a building and as an institution, can be viewed as somebody's heritage, connected to somebody through some we. And when we are connected to something through some us, we think of it as a member of that us. We think of it as, in some sense, ours. Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and Confucius's Analects are mine as a philosopher. Uh, Great Zimbabwe and the rock-cut tombs in the Valley of the Kings are mine as an African. They're from my continent. The United States Constitution and the Declaration of Independence are mine as an American. The mausoleum of the Asante kings is mine as the son of an Asante father. Gloucester Cathedral is mine through my mother, an Englishwoman born in Gloucestershire, and mine too as someone who was raised as an Anglican. It's an Anglican cathedral. At the same time, all these things are yours, as well as mine, as human beings. Heritage comes to you always because you think of yourself as connected through some collectivity by way of some sort of connection. So the incredible multiplicity of heritage derives as much from the many we's we belong to as from the many ways in which we can be connected. We go wrong to dissolve the particularity of our connections in the solvement of universality. Both particularity and universality matter. Notice, however, that in the globalized world we live in today, we are shaped not just by what has happened on the territories where we live, and not just by what was done by people who shared our national or ethnic or religious identity, but for good and ill, by the whole interacting history of our species. Everybody everywhere is now affected by something, many things, from many other places, to an extent that wasn't true uh, when, say, cosmopolitanism was first developed by the Greeks in the, in the fifth century. Uh, Diogenes the Cynic didn't know that China existed, so he couldn't do much to affect China. <laughs> so let's go back uh, to the Benin Bronzes and the Benin Empire and the works, as I say, known as these Royal Bronzes. The term, I should say, is a misnomer. The so-called bronzes include works of wood and ivory, but chiefly they consist of metal plaques and sculptures made of brass. And these remarkable brass works distill a fascinating history of interaction. This is the point about the whole interacting history of the species. Starting five centuries ago, the Edo people established a markedly hierarchical empire known as Benin, with the king, the Oba, directly in control of trade and in personal possession of the highest value goods in the kingdom, leopard skins, ivory, and so on rather like an absolute Danish monarch. The empire was constantly waging war, and in time, a great source of wealth was trading captives, human war spoils, to the Portuguese, who were at that time the major players in the transatlantic slave trade. Recall that nearly five million enslaved Africans were shipped to the Portuguese colony of Brazil, 40 or 50% of the historical total. That's why that's the widest arrow on the left-hand side of that map. In 1514, the Oba actually sent an embassy to Europe aiming to expand trade with the Portuguese. 
Now, you'll notice that many of these Benin bronzes are depictions of Portuguese people, some evidently traders, but some armed mercenaries uh, in the employ of the Oba. That's because the Portuguese were symbols, his relationship with the Portuguese and the Portuguese who lived with him were symbols of his own wealth. They were valuable assets, just as his own fierce warriors were. And so we come to a history that the discussion of the Benin bronzes tends to say too little about. Many of these marvelous objects were literally made out of payments for slavery. You see, one main currency with which the Kun Kingdom was paid was a horse-shaped, horseshoe-shaped uh, item of currency made of copper brass, or brass, uh, usually imported from uh, Europe and called uh, usually a Manila. It's true that the West Africans, including the Edo people, including my ancestors, had an old tradition of lost wax sculpture using brass, but brass wasn't so easy to come by. And the reason that these Benin brasses were so plentiful, they number in the, in the tens of thousands, is that those manilas were so plentiful. In short, if the Edo people in the kingdom of Benin had not believed in the legitimate acquisition of property through conquest, they wouldn't have had the resources to make the Benin bronzes. The practice of war spoils gained them these bronzes. The same practice later took many of them away. There are Asante masterworks in the British Museum, from where I grew up in Asante, along with the Benin bronzes, that were similarly acquired in a punitive ex expedition, uh, less well known now than the punitive expedition from the British that took the Benin bronzes. Um, this one was, uh, um, history is full of ironies, this one was led by the founder of the Boy Scouts, uh, Robert Baden-Powell, in uh, 1874. So he visited my hometown. One of my favourite passages in his account of the assault tells what happened when British troops entered the Asante Palace and, as he puts it, quote, the work of collecting valuables and property was proceeded with. He went on, Perhaps one of the most striking features about it was that the work of collecting the treasures was entrusted to a company of British soldiers and that was done most honestly and well without a single case of looting. Here was a man with an arm full of gold-hilted swords, there one with a box full of gold trinkets and rings, another with a spirit case full of bottles of brandy, yet in no instance was there any attempt at looting. Um, so he gives us a picture of looting and then says that that was not looting. And that distinction, of course, seems to us absurd, but that's because Baden-Powell was making the same distinction that Cicero had made between public taking of stuff from other people and private takings. He was saying that these soldiers weren't going to put it in their own pockets, they were going to give it to the British government. Uh, not until the 1970s uh, did an Asante king uh, he happened to be my uncle, but I, he didn't ask my advice, uh, request the return of this treasure. It's my, my uncle. Uh, so why did a century elapse? Well, start with the fact that my Asante ancestors were avid practitioners in the matter of war booty themselves. Inevitably, some of the items in the king's palace were of British origin. So some of what Baden-Powell took was going home. You see, this wasn't the first Anglo-Asante war. In the first Anglo-Asante war, which started in 1823 in, with a territorial dispute, uh, my ancestors on one side routed my ancestors on the other side and killed the British governor, forcing the British to withdraw all the way to Sierra Leone. Uh, at that time, the spoils of war came into Asante hands from the British. So when the turnaround came, the Asante were distraught no doubt, but they couldn't exactly be outraged. Turnabout, as the British say, is fair play. All right, so far I've been discussing heritage issues involving parties with plausible ancestral connections to the cultural property in question. But consider one of the most famous objects of antiquity, now housed in the Louvre, uh, the Code of Hammurabi, which dates to 1750 BCE, roughly. Excavated in 1901, from a site in southwestern Iran with the permission of the then authorities in that country. 
Yet, by the expansive logic of the Sir Savoy report, that leader could be considered, quote, implicated within the colonial process. So should the steel be returned to Iran? Well, Hammurabi's code isn't part of Persian history. Uh, King Hammurabi reigned in the old Babylonian empire in what's now Iraq. This room is full of people who know this history. Uh, this steel ended up in an Elamite city because back in the 12th century BCE, it was seized as war booty. So whose heritage is that? What we find, I think, is that the current discourse about heritage carousels among different models of ownership. One involves descent groups connected through ancestry, as with the present-day Oba, uh, Edo Oba of, of uh, what was Benin. Another model is just territorial. Plenty of artifacts, after all, have no real connection to a currently existing group. Consider the famous uh, Nok terracottas of Nigeria, which date as far back as 500 BCE, we know almost nothing about the society that created them. And nobody today has a realistic claim to be Nock. So as in many cases that involve antiquities, we treat these objects as state property, like mineral deposits. They belong to the country where they left the ground. A third model involves something more like identity. You can argue that something has become your cultural heritage by the workings of time and proximity. Consider how Italians feel about the obelisks of Rome. Some from the 19th dynasty of Egypt have been in Rome longer than they were in Egypt. They've been in Rome for two, more than 2,000 years, which is longer than they reposed in Pharaonic Egypt. So you might say, for many states, plunder plus time equals heritage. Now, these models can collide, and objects can be meaningful for different reasons to different people, as I just suggested with that catalogue of things that I think of myself as connected with. Think, for example, about some of Napoleon's military regalia. Viewed as cultural property, they're important to the French and their sense of their own history. But Waterloo was a huge deal for the British and their sense of their history. And these guys were captured at Waterloo and belong now in Britain. When Wellington defeated Napoleon, he actually had engraved various, on various of Napoleon's swords the words, this sword was won by the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> so now they have elements of British and French heritage in their physical constitution. Consider now another item of French heritage and a sword that Napoleon had at Austerlitz, perhaps his greatest victory. What happened to it? Well, his great nephew, the son of Napoleon III, carried it into battle in 1879 in South Africa, hoping to prove his valor by joining the Anglo-Zulu War. On an ill-advised patrol, he ran into a group of Zulu warriors, losing both his life and his sword. Now suppose the Zulu nation laid claim to it. If the incident was important to the Zulu people, would they have a heritage claim to it? Or should they be obliged to repatriate it to the French? Perhaps you may think the Oba of Benin presents a more straightforward case. Here we have the legitimate successor to an old line of kings laying claim to what had been possessions of, his, of a palace. And the 40th Oba of Benin, Owari II, has certainly continued many palace traditions, including the ownership of high-valued items. On his enthronement in um, 2015, he came into possession of a customized white Rolls-Royce Phantom 7 worth half a million dollars, adorned with a vast gold medallion on the front. Honoring tradition too, the Oba of Benin has not apologized for the kingdom's participation in the slave trade, unlike some other African customary rulers, actually some in the country of Benin, which is not part of Nigeria, but has the same name now. Last year, when Nigeria's President Buhari took possession of a couple of Benin bronzes repatriated by two British universities, he notably characterized them in the language not of heritage, but of the marketplace. He said they were, quote, high-priced objects. They were returned in a ceremony to Owari II. A few days after the bronzes were repatriated, the Oba made his way in his Phantom Seven 
to pay a visit to General Obasanjo, the billionaire former Nigerian head of state. And what did the Oba bring the general as a gift? You've guessed it, some royal Benin bronzes. Now, the general has nothing to do with Edo state. It's not his cultural heritage. But if cultural property is indeed property, why shouldn't the Oba make a present of his own treasures, even if they've only just recently come home? Egyptian heads of state, from Muhammad Ali in the 19th century to Nasser and Sadat, uh, routinely gave ancient Egyptian artifacts to foreign dignitaries, presumably in their capacity as Egyptian heads of state, as representatives of the Egyptian people. Yet many contemporary theorists of heritage don't believe that they were entitled to do so. According to that account of heritage, cultural property isn't like some other forms of property. It's not something you can give, sell, or transfer. You possess it in the way you possess your ancestry. You can't unpossess it. Something like this model explains why the Church of England is returning a Benin bronze that was a gift in 1982 from someone who was both a traditional Edo chief and the elected governor of the state whose capital is Benin City the Edo capital. If anybody was authorized to do something for that state, you'd have thought it was a traditional chief who was also the elected governor. But on this account of cultural property, there are really no procedures or conditions that make its transfer permissible, despite its having been done in this case by an Edo leader who is both traditionally and democratically legitimate. And now we run into another quandary. Our concept of cultural property is the 20th century invention of Western lawyers. Why should the Oba embrace that concept? It's tempting to suggest here that the colonial enterprise is conceptual rather than material. We're imposing a particular way of thinking about cultural property on everybody else in the world. In his book's discussion of the Benin Bronzes, the Oxford curator of world archaeology supposes that once returned to the Oba, the items will be displayed in the Benin City Museum that the wonderful anglo ghanaian architect Sir David Adjaye has been asked to design by the governor of Edo State. He omits to mention that the Oba strenuously, object, strenuously objects to that museum and to the idea that the governor, a mere elected civilian, should have any role in the disposition of these objects. President Buhari apparently shares this view. Uh, in one of his last acts as Nigeria's leader, he's about to be replaced uh, next month by a new president, he has declared this month that all the Benin bronzes belong to the Oba, blind signing the National Commission for Museums and Monuments, which has managed the, the negotiations so far. And I'd love to know the story of how that happened. As we've seen, one model of cultural heritage directs their return to this unrepentant heir of a slaving empire to be displayed or gifted at the discretion of the royal court. Another insists that their possession is inalienable. The ideal of reparative justice, meanwhile, reminds us that these objects were crafted from human plunder and asks us to think about human victims who have no bejeweled leader to press their claims. There are African Americans who say that because of the way these things were created, they should be in the United States uh, where the slaves' descendants are. They should be where the people whose lives were destroyed in the slave trade to make these bronzes. They should be where, where those people are. And the concept of cultural property really doesn't help us, I think, thought, sort through these questions because there are so many uh, historical complexities and so many moral complexities. As various UNESCO documents remind us, cultural heritage includes intangibles, ceremonies, rites, rituals, social practices. Among these age-old practices, as we've seen, is the taking of war spoils. But if war spoils have a long history, so does repatriation. After the Second Punic War in 2001 BCE, the Roman general, uh, Scipio Africanus, defeated Hannibal and gained control of Carthage. Carthaginian spoils were sent back to the Greek cities in Sicily from which they'd been taken. As a canny imperialist, Scipio was positioning himself as a pious protector of Hellenic communities. 
I hate to have to admit this, but that isn't actually a picture of Scipio Africanus. It's uh, something that was in a museum in Naples for a long time as a picture of uh, Scipio Africanus. It turns out this actually <laughs> an Egyptian priest. So there you are. Uh, what kind of cultural heritage is that? And so with Octavian, the founder of the Roman Empire, after his forces defeated Antony and Cleopatra, Egypt was pillaged as usual, but the man who became Caesar Augustus hewed to a policy of repatriating artworks that Antony and Cleopatra had plundered from cities in Asia Minor. In maintaining an empire, he knew goodwill is a valuable political asset. He also knew that these works were far more meaningful to those communities than they were to him or to Rome, and not simply out of a sense of property rights. Scipio and Octavian already understood that in these matters, identity matters. And yet to recognize that identity is genuinely important when it comes to the way we relate to objects doesn't mean, I think, that we should simply reduce um, ownership to identity. For one thing, African artisans, like artisans in every continent, have always created objects that were meant to be traded. Creativity and commerce are not separate activities. Uh, think, for example, of the famous uh, Afro-Portuguese ivories. These items were made, indeed, by African art uh, uh, artists for the Portuguese, who sometimes sold them on. Um, Albrecht Dürer acquired, acquired some. Uh, these were commissioned objects. They were not intended for local use, but you'll find calls to repatriate them, even these things. They might have been traded on unfavorable terms, it's said. Why not return them? We're left reconciling our ideas of justice to the prospect of further enriching predatory elites or their progeny if we return them to the Kingdom of Berlin. The issue of wrongful or exploitative trade is a serious one. In the Sar Savoir report, we're told about a French ethnographic expedition that led to the collection of, among other things, pre-Islamic Dogon, religious art, from Mali. Now, we know a great deal about this exposition because the great uh, French writer, Michel Leris, who was also a museum person, uh, kept extensive notes and published them as Phantom Africa. And what we learn is that some items were acquired through chicanery, theft, or extortion. But we also learn that after bargaining, certain items were sold at a price agreeable to both parties to the exchange. We learn that still other items were never obtained because the people refused to sell them. Uh, because of it, or because a village chief held out for a price that uh, uh, Griol didn't think worth paying. Uh, Leris, who writes about his French colleagues with withering contempt, was rather appalled by the episodes of pilfering, but he concedes that uh, episodes of outright theft were rare. In the majority of instances, what Leris sardonically called boutin seems to have been acquired for an agreed price from people who were entitled to sell it. So you might think that such objects, many of which are now in the Musée de Cape Henri in Paris, can continue to serve the function that Leris hoped they would, reducing ethnocentric prejudices by making the civilizations of Africa intelligible to Europeans and people who visited Europe. As I indicated, Leris's account is deeply misanthropic. He depicted many of the African priests and chiefs he encountered as duplicitous and manipulative as well, uh, like his French companions. But it's to his credit that he didn't see them the way they're often depicted today, as credulous innocents, capable only of being cheated and never capable of getting the better end of a deal. We should be mindful too that as the Malian countryside became more conventionally Islamic in the generations to follow, Many of these Dogon so-called fetishes were destroyed. It was a sign that you had given up the superstitions of your ancestors and fully embraced the world of the Muslim faithful. Just in the past decades, in parts of Mali that have fallen under the control of Salafi insurgents, even Sufi shrines and tombs have been destroyed for being insufficiently Islamic. So imagine what they've done to things that they think of as pagan. But then iconoclasm, 
the destruction of objects that offend against our piety is another part of our human heritage. The Hague Convention be damned. These are all instances of European iconoclasm. This is why UNESCO treaties meant to preserve heritage can have the opposite effect. In the late 1990s, you'll recall hardliners in the Taliban regime were noisily calling for the destruction of figurative pre-Islamic objects, and famously they did destroy the parts of the Bamun Buddhas. Curators in Afghanistan's National Museum sent out feelers to their colleagues in institutions elsewhere, and finally a deal was made to crate up endangered artifacts from the museum and move them to Switzerland for temporary safekeeping. As a UNESCO signatory, the Swiss simply needed UNESCO approval of the transfer. But UNESCO officials refused, citing strictures against moving antiquities from their countries of origin. Staff members at the museum have described some of what then happened. They were ordered to open drawers of antiquities by Taliban inspectors in the wake of Mullah Omar's February 2001 edict against pre-Islamic art. Here were drawers of extraordinary Bactrian artifacts and Gandhara heads and figurines. Taliban inspectors methodically opened these drawers, took out mallets and pulverized their contents. I've spoken of how we relate to objects through our identities, but identities can motivate us to demolish objects as well as to preserve them. So let's go back for a moment to Sheikh Omar Saidu Tal, the hero of the Sa Savoir story and that saber I mentioned earlier. Who was Omar Tal? In the middle of the 19th century, as I said, he built a vast Muslim empire, the Tukulor Empire, mostly in what's now Mali, devoted to slaving, war booty, and the religious and physical destruction of paganism and its artifacts. His great call was to convert pagan Africans to Islam, often forcibly, and he conducted his jihad with extraordinary resourcefulness trailing a notable contingent of enslaved Hausa uh, serv serv servitors. His soldiers uh, toppled the mighty Segu Empire of the Bambara, entering its capital in 1861, sacking the palace and arranging for a very public burning of Segu's so-called fetishes. From our perspective, that is to say, Omar Tal ranked among his proudest achievements the wholesale destruction of cultural heritage. What history do we want to revisit indeed? None of this appears in the Sar Savoir report. And why should it? Since cultural heritage encompasses identity-related practices, iconoclasm, the concerted destruction of cultural heritage, is itself a cultural heritage. Inasmuch as the Dakar Djibouti expedition of Leris kept objects from being destroyed, it was obstructing another expression of heritage. In the wake of the Sar Savoir report, France did indeed return the, Savoir, the Omar Tal Sabre. A public ceremony was held in Dakar in which France's prime minister handed the Sabre to Senegal's president. At least a symbolism, it seemed a step towards the restitution that the report had demanded. But why Senegal? Although the object is called Omar Tal Sabre, it actually belonged to his son Amadou and was seized from him by the French in 19, 1893 after a battle in Mali. The French, that is, took it as a war prize. Now, Amadou was the ruler of the eastern regions of what had been the Segu Empire. He wasn't a resident of what today is Senegal at all. His palace was in Segu Sikoro on the Niger River. That's about 1,400 kilometers from Dakar. Whose heritage is this? Well, here's where modern national narratives play a role. Many people in Mali regarded Omar Tal as an invader who presided over carnage, destruction, and disorder and brought the ideal of an Islamic state into bad repute. But in Senegal, Omar Tal, born on a village along the border between Senegal and Mauritania, represents a vision of triumphant eastward imperial conquest. And they nurture a somewhat spurious notion of him as an anti-colonial figure, that is, anti-French colonial figure, a colon colonizing other people, that was his business. A fictive but stirring narrative connects Senegal to this stable. Now, identities almost always subsist on fictional narratives, but to give them authority in arguments about cultural property, you end up with a good deal of history that you must not revisit. A final detail, 
the actual sabre blade was a French manufacturer, which is to say that the sabre originated in war spoils, albeit from the other direction. But of course, as I've been suggesting, the seizing of booty is itself one of those intangible practices that the term cultural heritage might encompass. So the thought that I want to encourage is that a unitary idea of property in which something is either mine or thine ultimately betrays a usable idea of heritage. If something qualifies as heritage, I say with the Hague Convention, it is the heritage of humankind as well, and the global constituency should not be excluded from consideration. From this cosmopolitan perspective, we should care about access for all, but we should also care about accuracy. When it comes to museum practices, intimacy does not always serve understanding. The Museum of Islamic Art in Doha has voluminous holdings spanning 13 centuries. It provides scholarly context. The building is lovely, uh, designed, by the way, uh, by an architect who was raised by a Buddhist mother. And the conditions are superb. I am happy that it exists. I like visiting it. Uh, and an Islamic museum with an is within an Islamic polity has advantages beyond self-affirmation. But it can have limitations too. This museum cannot acknowledge a plurality of faith traditions within Islam because it cannot treat Islam simply as a historical phenomenon. It cannot provide the full historical context of secular scholarship. There is one Ummah, one truth. It would not do to talk about this school or that faction. There is so much that can be seen and said in this museum, but there is much that cannot be brought into view. And if all Islamic art were presented under clerical supervision, the loss would be real. But is this not also true, mutatis mutandis, of the Benin bronzes? Germany is set to return 1,100 bronzes to Nigeria. Cultural patrimonialists hope that all the bronzes will be returned. If the Edo governor ultimately triumphs over the King of Benin and the uh, Ajay Museum is built, I'd be thrilled to visit it. But I'd worry if somebody put the King of Benin, um, the Edo King, uh, in charge of the placards because he's the unrepentant heir of a slaving empire. My point is that to take restitution seriously, we mustn't rely upon the over-selective, curated histories that enemies of the Encyclopedic Museum often purvey. Hegel notoriously declared that Africa was excluded from history. In polemics about the British Museums, alas, history is something that Europeans visited upon Africa. That um, picture loses sight of the reality that Africa has its own history, which is more than a history of depredation by European power. In the world that I grew up in, Africans had history because Africans had agency. One of my names is Akramam Pem. I'm named for a fierce 18th century Asante general, my ancestor. The villagers in the village he founded remember his exploits in detail to this day. But many of them descend from his war captives. So we don't discuss how he came by his manilas. This history isn't a two-dimensional story of European dominators and the African dominated, and it can't be undone, it can't be unwound. The Encyclopedic Museum too has a history. It has been implicated in the very best and the very worst of what human beings do. But its counter-cosmopolitan critics conflating universality with imperialism would make these institutions more parochial less humanly expansive, less diverse, and all in the name of an incoherent and parochial concept of cultural property. I offer no simple solutions. When it comes to the circulation of culturally significant objects, I don't think a single heuristic will suffice. As I've argued, our models of heritage generate clashing claims. The values enshrined by museums, too, are multiple. Think back to the Asante Royal Museum, the Aban, in 19th century Kumasi, the one uh, violated by the founder of the Boy Scouts. It was not a mere storehouse of Asante heritage. The collection included books in many languages, European clocks, silver plate, Persian carpets, paintings and engravings and chests, 
Arabic scimitars, damask curtains, uh, Moorish handicraft, and so on. Yes, some of this was war booty, but what's striking is that the Asante Hini, the Asante King, was evidently impressed by what he'd heard about the British Museum, and he set out to create a notably cosmopolitan collection. Ideologues of cultural property think that when his treasures were taken, the affront was the loss of a Santi heritage, the work of local artisans. But for those who built the museum in Kumasi, the greater loss was of these artifacts from elsewhere in the world. They were harder to replace. Indeed, European and North American museums with their vast collections in storage might consider lending European art to African institutions. We have a lot of Asante objects in Kumasi, and I'm glad of it. Uh, one of my favorite museums there is this one, which was, when I was growing up, the home of Atumfo Osei Ajman Prempe II, my great uncle, and we used to visit him there after church on Sundays. But why not send the kind of work that isn't in that building and that we don't regularly get to see? That's uh, my great uncle. Um, why don't you send a Piero della Francesca, or a Benin bronze, or some Ming China, or a Mayan relief. For that matter, why don't we in Asante send back some of the war spoils that we seized from the British? One of the many symbols that recurs regularly in Asante iconography is a little bird with its head turned back. To pick at the feathers between its wings, it's called Sankufa, which literally means go back and get. This one, believe it or not, is from the National Museum of Denmark, which I photographed on Friday. There's a tree proverb associated with this figure that says, If you throw something away and you go back and take it, that is not taboo. The proverb can be used to say, of course, that it is good to retrieve what you need from the past. We all understand that feeling. The connection people feel to cultural objects that are symbolically theirs because they were produced from within a world of meaning created by their ancestors, the connection to art through identity is powerful. I acknowledge it. The cosmopolitan in me, though, wants to remind us of the connections we have, not through identity, but despite difference. Museums can show us what we can do, what we have done. They show us the attainments of our various kinds, and they show us the attainments of humankind. At the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum and the National Museum of Denmark here in Copenhagen, there are great encyclopedic collections of heritage from every continent. Millions of people visit these museums every year, people who are themselves from every continent. What they see represents enormous labors of preservation, scholarship and programming and extraordinary access. I think it would be a terrible loss if blinkered notions about cultural property encouraged these encyclopedic museums to narrow their horizons. In short, the time has come, I think, to recognize the encyclopedic museum itself as part of global cultural heritage, worthy of being prized, sustained, and protected. Thank you very much.